And it looks like we're live. Um, I don't see it yet. Well, it, oh, it just popped a little live icon in the upper right hand corner. And right. There's a oh, broadcast. Wait, I see it going on. Ah, I see. There we go. Okay, I'm going to put the sound off over here, but I am going to uh, tweet this out. So let's see. We're going to tweet this out. Does it say how many people we have? Uh, that is an excellent question. I can't tell from here. Um, okay. I don't know. If that's some, I can't get the Hangout toolbox to work, but I have a suspicion right. that something that's over. goes with it. Yeah, maybe maybe we'll see some. Um, Maybe we'll see some live uh, comments. Do we have comments enabled? Uh, top chat. Top there is, chat. There's live chat. chat. There's live but chat. But I don't know if. OK. Well, we'll see. If someone's interested in it, they can uh, let us know. And uh, they can also email the show, localmaxradio at gmail.com. OK. I'm going to put this window down for now because watching myself is creeping me out. <laughs> Are you ready to start the show, Aaron? Ready as I'll ever be. Let's let's dive into this. Okay, I am going to um, start in five. Well, I'll say I'll start in five, and then remember the theme song is playing, so everything's got to be really exciting. Ready? Starting in five. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the local ma uh, maximum, Aaron. How you doing today? I am doing great. Thank you for joining me on episode number fifty-six of the Local Maximum. Um, we have kind of a theme today, I would say. We always have a theme. We, we usually talk about, but sometimes we talk about different articles and they don't really connect. I think they all connect today pretty well. We're going to give you a March news update. Um, we're going to talk about what to do with misinformation and bias and censorship. That's been like an ongoing theme in the local maximum. Um, I think today we're going to get to talk about the adversarial nature of this problem, how um, you know, the people who are trying to fight disinformation and the people who are trying to uh, spread disinformation, well, A, sometimes it's hard to figure out one from the other, and B, uh, you know, sometimes it's, um, you know, if one side gets better, the other side gets better. We have kind of an arms race, so it's an adversarial problem. Um, how does that sound? Uh, fascinating topic, and I'm excited to see where we go with this. All right, well, the first thing I want to point out as some of you know, uh, well, I thought this was very interesting because we've talked about Alex Jones on the show before, and he's sort of the poster boy for uh, for uh, censorship and like taking people off of off of platforms or deplatforming. So he appeared on the Joe Rogan show the other day, and I found that very interesting because you know he can't have a podcast now, his he can't go on YouTube or anything like that. Now all of a sudden the the biggest podcaster out there, Joe Rogan, Joe Rogan has him on his show for four hours. So it almost seems like it's a direct workaround of the system, uh, which I just think is really interesting. It's similar how Edward Snowden kind of comes to these events, uh, you know, these conferences in the U.S. via link from from Russia, and it's like, holy crap, you know, they can't censor anything. If this was going on 20, 30 years ago, or even 10 years ago. That would have been impossible. I, I did not realize that Snowden had been doing that. Um, and I've, I've seen it before. I don't know how often he does. Because yeah, he, he can't really do much traveling, but uh, apparently he's not letting that stop him from getting the word out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, maybe, I don't know if he's doing it uh, recently, but he's, um, he's it doing it. It has been done. Yeah. All right, so we're doing a live uh, YouTube chat on this one. And so that should be interesting. I don't know if anyone's listening right now. I got to learn how to use this. I don't know if anyone's listening to our show currently. I don't think anyone is. So, uh, But uh, hopefully in the future, we'll uh, publicize it a little more. And well, we'll you, you know what they say. It's, it's stream like nobody's watching. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, good. We don't have to pretend. <laughs> so I thought that I didn't... Did I listen to the whole four hours? I might have gotten sucked into way more of that than I wanted to, because uh, Jones is uh, completely off the wall. <laughs> but it's interesting. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I well, you you sprung it on me, and, and I was not expecting that that's what that link was going to be when you sent it to me. Yeah. And I, I did eventually listen to the the whole thing, but yeah, I he 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 was he was pretty off the wall. Although uh, I 
I, I, I hate to touch on on hot button issues because that's not well, they're not yeah. what we're talking about today. But of all the well, things he talked about, his discussion relating to Sandy Hook was the most level headed and sober thing he talked about the whole episode. Well, here's which, the problem. Here's what I say. Everybody I know who who talks about Alex Jones, it's like everybody in the world knows that he was taken off of the platform. He was deplatformed because he said that Sandy Hook didn't happen. And he really, it was a terrible thing for these um, these parents to hear someone go around and say, you know, Sandy Hook is a, is a false flag. Now he's saying he never said that. Or now I don't know if, if that's true that he never said that, but like. Right. It, I'm, now, I'm perhaps giving him too much credit taking it, at, at, taking him it's not at like, his word. It's not like he's going on each and every show and like hammering at home each and every show. So even if he did say it like six years ago, I mean, the one thing that Joe Rogan said that um, it, at one point that that I agreed with was he said one bad thing. You can't speak for the rest of your life. Yeah. And then to tie that into some other current events that made me think of uh, the whole Kevin Hart and Oscars hosting ordeal where he he basically got put on the spot for something he'd said and apologized for years ago. And it came up, and it was a problem again. And he was he was unwilling to prostrate himself again uh, mm. because of something he'd done years ago, and felt he'd already made amends for. And and that's why the Oscars were hostless this year. Well, that's crazy. Yeah. So it's. I mean, that's not. I understand there are reasons why you might want to take someone off a platform. I think, you know, there are some objective reasons, like, you know, uh, um, objective. There should be objective, um, what, what am I trying to say? Uh, objective uh, propositions put forward. Like yeah, you, you need a, a clear criteria. Yeah, like there's a legal definition of assault and battery, and you have to decide if this case fits that, versus people are just kind of winging it. And I feel yeah, like- not, not to be confused with, we need to let the, the government set the regulations for, you. No. the platforms can set their own rules, but it would behoove them uh, for their reputations and for the convenience of their users and their content providers to have a clearly stated and transparent process for how that happens. Yeah, well, I'm talking about how the platforms should, yeah. should define this stuff. And it's it, it and I feel like the line has to be set at a certain place where it's like, no, you have to be um, you have to be advocating violence, you have to be maybe doxing people putting all their stuff out online is reason to make you go. But short of that, I don't know. It's got to be pretty broad. Um, and there's a fine line between fighting disinformation and just, you know, deciding what's information or not. I'd rather, I, personally, this is really going to freak, this freaks some people out. I'd rather live in a world where there's lots of information and disinformation coming out and everybody has a responsibility to kind of talk about what's true and what's not versus having a, you know, single panel of ex experts decide what's true. And and we'll talk about that in a minute as we talk about Google's yeah. approach and, to and, fighting disinformation. And but it's frightening because there are a lot of people who won't do the, the homework uh, and will arrive at less than ideal conclusions. Um, but I'm willing but to, yeah. That's the risk of living in that world. Yep, that's the risk of living in the world. That's the risk that I want to take. I've talked about this a lot in uh, Fixing Facebook. Do you remember what, uh, show number that is. Let me see if I can get the show number on that one. Show number on that one. Going to the Facebook archive, <laughs> da, 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 uh, the or the local Max Radio archive. That would be show number nine on fixing oh, Facebook. Wow. So that was, that was way back in the in the original ten. Way back in the early days of the local maximum. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So. Recently, Google put out this blog post on fighting disinformation, um, and it was, let's see, it was, um, the, and they put out a white paper to explain it. They were talking about it's some, a place called the uh, Munich Security Conference, I'm trying to figure out when that was. That was maybe at the end of uh, February. That, that was February 15th to 17th, so pretty- Not that long ago. Pretty recently, yeah. And so Facebook put out this um, sort of, uh, uh, what do I want to say? It's, it's like a PowerPoint presentation or like a, a, a bunch of slides about, or actually, no, it was a long PDF, wasn't it? So a big long PDF about how they're going to fight disinformation. And so I wanted to go through some of the interesting things about that because this is a really important thing to understand. Google affects our lives immensely, like 
everything that we know about an issue is colored by how we see it through Google, like it or not. So, um, and even if you don't use Google, and I'm sure most of us do, you're still get you're still talking to everyone who uses Google. So, we want this to be right. And so, the first thing off the bat that I see that the um, person who put this together, the person whose name's on it, is someone with the title VP of Trust and Safety. Her name is Christy Canigallo. Um, now, first of all, I want to point out in episode 25, I talked about the same topic, um, censorship at Twitter. And I talked about how all of these different executives have different opinions on what Twitter should be doing. Some people at Twitter were very much for broadening the range of speech allowed, and some of them really were like, no, the problem is we have to really crack down. And the one that wanted to crack down the most was the person who had this title, VP of Trust and Safety. And I remember at the time being like, what the heck is this title, VP of Trust and Safety? I don't under, it almost reminds me of like the, isn't the, at the French Revolution, they had the um, Committee of Public Safety? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that's that's a reach back that I wasn't prepared to make. I, I was going to make the low blow that it's a very Orwellian title. That, yeah, it is. It is. In Orwellian. a situation where we have neither trust nor safety, we will have minister of trust and safety. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I guess so, Ministry of Truth would would be the the quintessential uh, 1984. But but yeah, right. Committee of Public Safety, who uh, was uh, instrumental in large amounts of beheadings, uh, yep. many of which had uh, you know kind of kangaroo court show trials. Well, some of the same stuff might go on here. Uh, so Hopefully I was very really curious. No beheadings will be involved. No, maybe only virtually. Um, <laughs> I was kind of curious as to, you know, how does one become a uh, VP of trust and safety? Like if I wanted to one day work my way up to be a vice president of trust and safety, what do I have to do? So I looked at this person's resume. She's got a very big resume, very gold-plated resume, I would say. She started at Goldman Sachs and then worked at the Department of Defense. And then after that, she had a bunch of roles in the Obama administration. She was, a, one of the titles is Assistant to the President and Deputy Chief of Staff for Implementation. And that turns out to be implementation of Obamacare. So Google, I mean, one of the, uh, issues with you know uh, bias is asking about, well, are these organizations politically biased? And it seems like Google is hiring a political official, or at least a bureaucratic official for this role. Um, I wrote here, possibly partisan, clearly partisan. I mean, you wouldn't be like, I don't know, a, a, a standard mainstream Republican would not want to get the job for implementation of Obamacare. Uh, so um, it, it, I, I just found that a very interesting well, uh, choice. Yeah. Not, not everybody who works in, in the administration is necessarily partisan. There are oh, some sure. people who are, who are very wonkish, who are you know, kind of technocrats. Uh, and right. I realize as I'm saying that, that I'm, I'm not using it as a complimentary term. But, uh, but, but it, it, it does seem likely that, that uh, you're going to have some some biases if if that's the mission you've been tasked with. Right, right. Um, but the question is, like, couldn't they hire someone from like why is it why are they hiring someone from that realm? Uh, could I'm not saying hire like a you know Carl Rove or something like that. I'm saying you know why, of course not. Why, why should they like? What kind of push, person should they pick? And so I'm thinking about okay, Goldman Sachs risk management. Um, I feel like this is a role where they're managing risk to the Google executives. This is well, not I, actually. This I was going to say. I, yeah. I think there's a different audience involved here. I, I don't think, yeah. gi given given what you've just called out about some of her previous roles and and the world that she's operated in, yeah. I would expect she's she's less uh, in charge of trust and safety for the consumer base and more in charge of trust and safety with the organizations who are going to very soon be attempting to regulate and possibly break up an antitrust. Um, so she, oh, I, it I looks see. like she's there to placate uh, people on Capitol Hill right. that, uh, that the company is acting in a safe and trustworthy fashion. But uh, yeah, a lot of these times, I mean, I've been, you know, I've worked for small companies and it's like, we want to think about the customer. We want people in those organizations to be, I'm gonna look out for the people who use these products. And I don't feel like that's what Google's doing here. And I don't feel like they do it very often. 
Um, they're looking out like when we're talking about getting rid of information to me, the number one thing about getting rid of information is to, is not just, um, you know, saving society or something like that. It's to look out for the people who are using Google. If I'm using Google, I'm going to be hurt if I believe something that's not true. So I want to have Google looking out for me. Like, why aren't they thinking of it like that? I don't think they're thinking of it like that. They, they don't seem to indicate that in this document or based on who they're hiring for this role. Well, you, you, you did call a couple of things out in your, your notes you share with me that, that point towards that and that this idea of uh, ensuring the usefulness of their services. Now, my, my question is exactly what does that mean? Um, right. How are they measuring that and and quantifying it? But I I think that's only a piece of what they're looking at, and and that there's a lot of of kind of liability uh, minimization going on here, less yeah, yeah. so than than serving their their user base uh, explicitly. Yeah. So let's go with the let's go with the kind of their three pronged approach. By the way, I should point out coming up later in the show, we're going to talk about those faces that aren't real, that look real. So just, I just want to tease that for a second because uh, everyone's excited about that. But let's talk about Google's three pronged approach uh, for, um, for getting, um, for, for solving this disinformation problem. I shouldn't say solving it, mitigating it. Um, and actually, some of this looks pretty reasonable on the surface, and they might be prongs that I would choose, but the first is make quality count for Google results. Um, and uh, the second is counteract malicious actors seeking to spread disinformation. And the third is give people context around the information they need. So all of that sounds very reasonable to me. The question is execution, how are you gonna do that? Um, and so they have a very interesting definition of fake news. That's important because there are satire sites. There are more kind of partisan political sites that are maybe not um, fake news, but um, you know there are people who kind of get things wrong on one side or the other, maybe. But the definition of fake news that they're using is um, uh, so. So they start by saying there's something objectively problematic and harmful to our users. So they are being user focused in this statement. When malicious actors attempt to deceive them, it's one thing to be wrong about an issue. It's another to purposefully disseminate information one knows to be inaccurate with the hopes that others believe it is true or create discord in society. We refer to these deliberate efforts to deceive and mislead using the speed scale and technologies of the open web as disinformation. So in other words, I am a bad person, bad actor. I want to make sure that everyone believes something that isn't true. And so I willfully spread that information and try to make sure they all believe that. Um, and and they're, they're, they're at least in intent saying that the case of, uh, you know, someone posting a parody or, or, or something that's, that's a spoof or a joke, that's not fake news. However, uh, or a rumor if, if, that everyone wants to believe. But, but if, if that parody gets picked up by someone who doesn't get that it's a parody, and it gets propagated as as fact that could morph into being treated as fake news. Am, well, am I reading that correctly, or what if they think it's fact because they saw it was parody and then they didn't realize it was parody? Exactly, so that's what I'm saying. That that someone someone didn't see this the the, uh, the sarcasm tag on something, uh, right? And so it, it gets taken as as fact and propagated. So has that become fake news? Um. I guess according to this definition, it wouldn't be because it's not willful dissemination of misinformation. Uh, but um, it seems Cause, like- Because I would say that, that most, and, and, and thinking back a little bit to our friend Alex Jones, yeah. um, most of the conspiracy theory stuff that you see, there may be some people who are maliciously spreading uh, information they know to be false, but I think that most people spreading conspiracy theory information uh, are true believers. Right, uh, right. Otherwise, I mean, well, then you get into the conspiracy of people starting conspiracy theories to 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 drive public opinion or or perception, and then that that's it's a Russian doll situation there. So I don't even know how to talk about that. Yeah, and I wonder, I wonder what the outcome of these discussions at Google are. They make this sound very straightforward, but it's it's not at all straightforward. Um, okay, so quote on quality count. They say that these algorithms are geared, geared towards use, uh, ensuring the usefulness of our services as measured by user testing, not fostering the ideological viewpoints of the individuals that build or audit them. And they call out three scores. So usually when you have these ranking algorithms on quality, 
again, I know because I built them, is you have a bunch of scores that are combined together uh, that usually so have some kind of a human recognizable aspect to them. So they point out expertise, authority, and trustworthiness. So I assume that one of them is going to be based on kind of a panel of experts describing, okay, is this person an expert in this? I don't know how you determine that. Authority might be, okay, how many in incoming links? That's that's Google's page rank. That's what they're oh, good at. That, that's what they mean by authority? No, 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 but I, I'm just uh, speculating. Oh, okay. Um, that must be somewhere in there. I mean, based on page rank, it, it's not page rank. If you just do a, a straight up page rank, it, it's not gonna work anymore because it doesn't handle spam very well. But I'm just saying something like, okay, uh, if a lot of authoritative people um, cite Aaron, then Aaron is probably authoritative as well. So it, it's kind of a um, it's it's kind of a graph based. Uh, uh, it, it seems like it's kind of a graph based measure from my perspective. And then third is trustworthiness, um, which is probably just some measure of how like just some fact checker on it, just to see, you know, how often is it wrong or not, regardless of the authority uh, or expertise. My, my concern with, with a, uh, a, a three-legged uh, stool like that of expertise, authority, and trustworthiness is those, those variables are not independent. Um, and I would expect that- Oh, they uh, never are, yeah. Oh, but th that's over, always- Over a long enough period of time, yeah. they become uh, singular in, in that uh, what one begets the other. Well, I don't know, Aaron. Uh, like, well, okay, here's the deal. Like, in any... we, we don't know enough about the algorithm they have behind this, how they're yeah, actually but, doing it. But, but I do know a lot about ranking algorithms in general, and I can tell you, almost always, these scores have they're never completely or orthogonal. There's always some aspect of them that are equal. But you don't want to. What you don't want to do is you don't want to create some kind of feedback loop on the other. So, for example, I say, okay. Um, you know, the ones with the most likes, let's say you have likes, the ones with the most likes go at the top, but then the ones at the top are most likely to get the more likes. Yeah. And so they created kind of a feedback loop where, you know, the, the, the rich get richer kind of a situation. And so if you create a, th a feedback loop between the three of those somehow, somehow one metric is changing Google to adjust its results and then it's affecting the other metric, then they kind of, um, then they kind of bleed into each other. And so that's always a problem. I mean, that's something, look, Google engineers have heard of this. They know what's going on with that. But it's it's always a problem. It could happen, um, I mean, you're right. But they're never completely orthogonal, um, of course, um, because somebody who is, hopefully somebody who has more expertise is more trustworthy as well, although like probably more likely to be, but. Yeah, you know, it, it also seems like a lot of this is built the, around yeah. coming up with a, a a systematic way that we can make uh, traditional publishing uh, rise to the top, despite all the other information that's out there. And, right. and so on the one hand, they yeah. sh in theory they should be better at this, uh, but but I think a lot of people have been disappointed with what traditional publishing uh, has has brought to the table in terms of reporting in the last decade or so. Yeah, and, and yeah. I mean there there was. There was kind of the uh, the failed movement of of citizen journalism, where all of a sudden, with with the advent of blogs, even before Twitter, we thought, well, everybody is going to be a reporter, and that's how the the real stories are going to get out there. We're not going to be dependent yeah. on the New York Times setting up a you know a bureau in 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 a certain area to to get the the relevant stories there. Uh, you know, ser serving underserved communities and all that, but. That, that didn't pan out the way people envisioned, envisioned it then, but there's still a, a glut of coverage of every topic under the sun, and the legacy media is, is struggling to rise to the top of that, and, and they would love nothing more than to be considered trustworthy, authoritative, and experts on the matter. Whether they are or not, I, I think the jury is out. Yeah, right, that's the question. Is this either deliberately or um, in effect um, trying to set into place the um, kind of journalistic, the the, uh, the, uh, the 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 journals, the news outlets that already exist and are already considered uh, to be trustworthy by the establishment. They don't have to continually um, show their trustworthiness. They're just automatically by name given this designation, 
and then they just stay there and there's no competition. I mean, if that's what ends up happening, well, then this is a terrible system. Um, so the they write these algorithms are geared towards ensuring the usefulness of our service services. So that's kind of interesting, like usefulness um, is a word. Um, I think they yeah. want to use truthfulness, but uh, you like a lot of people. Well, yeah, the, the problem with usefulness is that if I'm looking for something to confirm my 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 opinions, my biases, my thoughts on that, uh, how how useful that uh, piece of information is to me may be completely divorced from how uh, how connected to facts on the ground that might be. That if if I'm looking for uh, for let, let's let's take a flashback to oh, gosh, would it, would it be 2008, 2010? Uh, and, and I'm convinced that uh, Barack Obama was born in Kenya, then oh, yeah. when I do a Google search and I come up with, with something about uh, how his birth certificate is faked, it's going to be Donald very Trump useful said. to me. But it may not have any factual basis to it at all. Right. So, so, so how they define usefulness and how they're measuring that, it, it's, it sounds like that's not clearly defined here, and, and that's going to be important. Um, well, it is, it is clearly – well – Maybe not. There's only so much that you could clearly define it, but they do write a little bit more about it. One is their reliance on expert panels. So they have this um, news initiative thing at Google where they are um, they're investing in <laughs> initiatives at various newsrooms around the country. And so that's interesting. Like, are they trying to drive innovation in the field, like they say, or are they trying to get a uh, foot in the door in some of these newsrooms <laughs> to try to either tell them what to write or, you know, get have them be the experts to tell Google what to what to promote. Yeah, well, and, and I think we've talked about it on this show before. Um, oh gosh, I, I want to say it's the Dunning Kruger effect, but I, I think there's there's a a close cor corollary to that, which is uh, more specifically about how uh, when when you're an expert in a field and you read an article about it in your local newspaper or or even a national newspaper, and you realize. They have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. They've gotten everything not not only have they gotten everything wrong, they've gotten it so wrong to the extent that that it's it's fractally wrong. And and you just, just if you were to interpret everything the opposite of the way they've said it, you'd be closer to the truth. And then you turn the page to uh, you know the the national politics or international news section, and you take them at, the, at their word because that's a field you're not an expert in, and you forget all of a sudden that they got everything wrong on that specific article you were looking at before. Uh, and so uh, that, that's one of my big issues with with allocating high uh, high levels of of authoritativeness and trustworthiness and and certainly expertise to most media outlets uh, be, because they might be speaking to the right people, lucky, but they themselves have very limited knowledge in pretty much all of the relevant fields. Yeah. All right. So before we get on to the next thing, I just want to talk about the risks that they put in this document. So one, they're talking about protecting elections. They claim that they've trained both uh, Republican and Democratic officials on how to protect themselves from fake news. Um, there is this sense that they really only cared about affecting elections after the last one, but I'm not going to talk about that again. Um, uh, well, I guess, and, and I don't have the details on this, but I know there's been uh, a lot of hubbub, I think, in Australia about um, the infiltration or hacking of, of both parties' uh, uh, IT infrastructures and networks and concerns about how the elections might be compromised coming mm -hmm. up down there. So it's it's not just a U.S. problem either. Yeah. And the, the second one they mention is how they acknowledge the adversarial nature of the problem. That's a very important thing to acknowledge. They say, I'm going to quote them here. To stay ahead of the curve, we continuously invest resources to stay abreast of the next tools, tactics, or technologies that creators of disinformation may attempt to use. We convene with experts all around the world to understand what concerns them. We also invest in research, product, and policy developments to anticipate threat vectors that we might not be equipped to uh, tackle at this point. One example is the rise of new forms of AI-generated photorealistic synthetic audio or video known as synthetic media, often referred to as deep fakes. While this technology has useful application, for example, by opening up new possibilities to those affected by speech or reading impairments or new creative grounds for artists and movie studios around the world, it raises concerns when used in disinformation campaigns and for other malicious purposes. So I wanna pull that apart for a second. So the first part is 
people who are spreading disinformation are always finding new and clever, clever ways to do it. That is undeniably true. And that's why this is a never ending fight. Just like, you know, well, just like the traditional arms race being, uh, having like the best, um, the best military in the world requires constant, um, constant upgrading and having the best anything in the world almost requires constant upgrading because there's sort of a, that there's sort of a pull and push nature of it. And one example is, well, now you can't just spread fake, you know, text. Uh, you're going to spread fake photos and fake videos and so on and so forth. Uh, so, yeah, and, and, and uh, I think none of that is new. It's the, yeah. the new is the speed with which it can happen. We, yeah, we haven't had a case where people actually have, I haven't seen a high profile case where there's some th synthetic audio or synthetic video that like fooled the entire world. That uh, we yet. know of. That we know of. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> um, I assume it would later come out or at least the person involved would like at least claim that, um, that it was faked, but I don't really see any high profile. I, I can think of some cases where it, it should have been used uh, and mm. it was not, but. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> But, but I don't want to dive off and well, so 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 there's the classic example. No, go uh, on, go on, please. I, I can't remember the, the the guy's actual name, but uh, I, I, everyone referred to him as Baghdad Bob, and he was he was one of uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, publicity right. officers, right. and and he was on national television talking about how you know there is no invasion. The the U.S. tanks are miles and miles away from downtown Baghdad, while like tanks are driving past him in the background. <laughs> Uh, I think like, uh, a, a green screen and, and, and some, uh, some, some slight modification to that footage would have done wonders for his credibility, at least yeah. for the you know, few hours he had left. Uh, I remember Baghdad, but he's still around. Like, he's he, not a... he survived? Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, good, good for him, a, I guess. I think he's still got a job, yeah. He's, um, he, he, let's he see. He should probably put his resume into the White House. They're always looking for <laughs> Yeah, what's his post-war life? Let's look at this. Uh, <laughs> yeah, who knows? I I don't know where he was, but yes, he definitely um, he definitely survived he, the war. He made oh, it alive, yeah, 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 sure. Um, okay, um, so now they turned. The last thing they did was turn directly to YouTube, which is interesting. We're using YouTube right now. We're using Google right now. Hopefully, they don't shut us off their AI system, like <laughs> you know. It's, it's easy to forget that that YouTube is part of the vast. Uh, uh, yeah. Should I should we refer to it as the the Google family products or is it really the Alphabet uh, portfolio? Yes, the Alphabet Empire. That I hope their AI isn't listening. So uh, apparently we have very people, very few people listening live. But if the Google AI is listening live, it might be like they're asking some questions. Shut it down. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> so um, okay. So. Um, YouTube, they claim their actions are taken for, they claim that they're going to be after consistent enforcement. That's what I'm talking about. Um, so if, if you go to Google and you say, hey, I want consistent enforcement, they're going to say, they're not going to say, oh, uh, we never thought of that. Or they're not going to say, oh, no, that's, that's a bunch of crap. We're just going to enforce whatever we want. No, they say that they're for consistent enforcement. Um, and so... Uh, this is kind of how they say how it works. Google has thousands of reviewers who operate 24 seven to address content that may be, uh, violate our policies. And the team is constantly expanding to meet evolving enforcement needs. Our review teams are diverse and global. Linguistic and cultural knowledge is needed to interpret the context of a flag video and decide whether it violates our guidelines, which actually that, that reminds me, it should be interesting. I wonder if like a controversial topic in one country should actually be reviewed by someone who comes from an entirely different culture who might be better off like enforcing the rules as stated. Well, and, um, and if they do ban or, or flag something, is it across the platform or could they, uh, and, and this, this might be very, uh, very relevant to some of the things they've been talking about in China, but, uh, you know, well, okay, this, this footage or this film is, is perfectly fine outside of, uh, of, of China, but, yeah. but within that, we're no longer going to serve it up. Well, that's, I mean, that's when you have specific governments who have trouble with, uh, with certain things. I think or, if or, they don't want it on their platform, they'll take it off their platform everywhere because or that's perhaps, you know, th this is a video that depicts, uh, that depicts Allah, uh, 
Uh, and so we're not going to make this available in any Muslim majority countries. Yeah, maybe, I don't know. Um, uh, just to finish this, reviewers go through a comprehensive training program to ensure that they have a full understanding of YouTube's community guidelines. So you have kind of, uh, we use frequent tests as part of the training process to ensure quality and knowledge retention. Human reviewers are essential to evaluating context and to ensuring that educational, documentary, scientific, and artistic content is protected. So, well, except for that last part, because man, some of those, sometimes those copyright rules can get very overbearing, but some of this sounds like, hey, this on it, the face of it is some of the... Um, well, I, I didn't read that as a, as a comment on, on copyright. I thought that was, it was mostly that uh, we're, we're oh, going really? to use humans to find the exceptions of things that, that the algorithm would censor, but because they have educational or or artistic value, we're going to keep them up anyway. So like satire, maybe. Like a, a certain satire where it's like, um, yeah, well, or, or there's, I mean, there have been plenty of incidents of, of pieces of art which people find are offensive. Um, examples coming to mind mostly have to do with uh, religious themes. Oh, yeah, back um, here, uh, a, a couple decades ago, or was it like 10, 15 years ago? Back here, I'm pointing over there, the uh, Brooklyn <laughs> Museum, because I'm right here, had got into the trouble for that. Yeah, any, anytime you combine uh, religious uh, symbolism and and uh, bodily fluids, you, you're looking yeah. at a danger zone there. Yeah, I, um, I don't think that's the kind of thing that they'll be going after. Um, so, okay, so they have these, man, it all depends they have a system like we are going to have this army of people around the world and we're going to publish these standards. And it's like, it, it just seems like it's not going to work the way they think it's going to work. But yeah, we'll well, and, and I can sympathize a little bit with, you don't want to leave this purely to the algorithm because oh, yeah. that's not going to work. But I, I'm also very wary of, uh, oh gosh. That's I, what we talked about last time with David Auerbach. I don't know if you talked to right, you. Yeah listen to that, but how can't leave it to the algorithm, can't leave it to the people, but they're trying to get out They're You're trying to say, Hey, anything that we do is not like kind of a Google bias thing that something like we don't have our Google glasses on. We have our global glasses on, but I don't know if they'll actually be able to do that. This, this doesn't convince me of that. Right. Uh, right. And I, yeah. it's a hard problem. I'll, 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 um, I'll put it forth. It's a hard problem. I I don't. I mean, like, they're, they're, uh, unless unless they've made publicly available uh, the the criteria they're using and the training materials and the training process they're using, they um, should. Well, if but, they do, we'll look at that. I I suppose I mean, that that's one way they could oh, convince wait, me that they're being objective. But yeah, if they, they do that, then that can. makes it much easier for the adversarial system to find the. Uh, I don't like the term loopholes, but do to work around yeah. the constraints of, of, of their criteria, which yeah. I guess that's, that's a dangerous, it's, it's much like with encryption that, uh, if, if your, if your security comes from, from the, uh, the obscurity of your, your method, then it is not secure. Uh, and, yeah. and if their the strength of their, uh, their content evaluation process comes from nobody knowing what the criteria are, so that they can't work around it, then, then it's not a very robust system. And and I guess saying we don't want you to know the 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 precise details of the criteria we're using because we don't want you to work around them. Another way of saying work around them is comply with the letter of the law. Right. So well, I mean it also reminds me case, but. Yeah, but if we make an analogy to law, like it's illegal to assault someone, it is written down in well, there's a lot of legal text on what constitutes assault. We don't say, oh, yeah. that helps someone get around the loopholes, uh, you know, but. Um, yeah, there's, 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 the, there's the written law and, and established case law and, and all of that is, is public record. Yeah, yeah. There's, so there's I no wonder secret regulations that only judges and prosecutors have access to that, that they use to determine that stuff. Right, right. And I, so I wonder if this case is, should be more along the lines of a legal case where, hey, the law should be open and known to everybody and that way people can comply. And if someone so finds some like new and um, innovative way to get around the law, then it's like patched up as it, as it goes, but it's open or whether it's better for them to keep it secret. 
I want to hear what the listeners think. Localmaxradio at gmail.com on that one. Um, uh, I, I, to me, it's an open question. I, lo- I lean more towards the open process where, you know, in the case of judges, if you have some new technology comes in that like, you know, you can insult someone without being there. I don't know if you could like somehow blow up their computer by sending a virus and then it, it, it burns them. Well, that's, is that a battery? Is that, I don't know, but like judges can figure that out. And um, I wonder if, if you could have something similar in this case going on. Remain, remains to be seen. Yeah, I'm, I'm very yeah. curious to, to, to find out how much of this processing criteria they, they're making public uh, versus you know, proprietary uh, Google information. Yeah. All right. So you're ready to talk about generative adversarial networks. This is this is really Bring cool. Bring the GANs. Yeah, and then this is really um, this is going to be this is going to help you understand what's going on with uh, a lot of machine learning today. Um, there's this website called thispersondoesnotexist.com, and basically every time you go to thispersondoesnotexist.com and you refresh the page, you get another picture of a person. And the interesting thing about that person is you may have guessed it. They don't actually exist. It's generated by a computer. You have young people, old people, people of different ethnic backgrounds, uh, you can kind of tell, um, and uh, people with different facial features. And they all more or less look real-ish. Some of them have slight problems with it that make you go, oh, but, you know, <laughs> I think, but some people's faces are like that, you know? <laughs> I don't know what to say. It's true. Uh, but um, there's another... Uh, website that pairs with this one, and it perfectly describes what uh, Adversarial Network does, is whichfacesreal.com. And what that will do is it will show you two faces, one on the right and one on the left. And you'll have to click, which one do you think is the real face? And you look at them and you kind of think, both of them look real, but I tried to play it. I um, I played 10 times and I actually got the right face nine times. And what's interesting is I couldn't tell you why I felt the right face was the right face. I was just like, eh, this one kind of looks better. And it, I almost always got it right, which to me was very interesting and says that there's still something, well, the the, the GAN is still not as good as uh, as an individual person. Did you try that out, Aaron? I, I'm, I'm in fact looking at it right now as we're talking. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I'm, oh, I got one wrong. Uh, yeah, but it's I, I I was on a pretty good streak of identifying the real person. However, I would have a lot more trouble if you just gave me one photo and said, is this a real person or not? Uh, when they're side to my side, it's it, I, I feel like there's a, a better uh, better chance yeah. of picking out. Well, this, something looks a little bit off in this one, but. Well, it's better because you have now you know you have a 50-50 chance. And, th- there's that too. But yeah, yeah. Lo- looking even even if I knew it was a 50-50 chance, but with just one photo, yeah, uh, it's it's a lot harder to mm. they, they're good enough that they pass the 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 first look test. Um, right, right. It's however, only with the comparison. The, I don't know if it was the same uh, the same researchers that that came up with this person does not exist, and and I there's there's a white paper behind that and 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 whatnot. But uh, there was also a this cat does not exist. Mm. That one was a lot rougher, and and I don't know if it's. Uh, I, I heard someone mention, oh, maybe it's because instead of just doing faces, you're doing the whole cat, and so that's a yeah. lot harder. But but yeah, uh, where, whereas maybe nine out of ten times the uh, this person does not exist looks looks like a believable person. Uh, I think nine out yeah. of ten times the this cat does not exist looked like some sort of mutant cat from another dimension. Yeah, well, I saw some faces like that too. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so here's here's how a generative adversarial network works. Um, I know it's a big word, but um, you're essentially so when you create a machine learning algorithm, you're basically in most cases you're trying to predict something or you're trying to label something. That's the main case of uh, supervised learning. So in this case, you're actually building two learners at once. And they perfectly correspond to these two websites. So you have one learner that is the discriminator model, and then you have one learner that's the generator model. So I think probably by using these websites, it's actually, um, you're actually helping, I mean, they might be feeding it back in to retrain these models. But um, the discriminator model, what that's really good at is distinguishing between a real face and a fake face. And this can be done really well through a model called a convolutional neural net. Um, 
I t- it was invented by Jan LeCun, who is uh, my professor at NYU. I actually kind of built a very simple one in his class that can sort of do character recognition on numbers. Um, and we also implemented convolutional neural nets a little bit in Foursquare to kind of figure out uh, what's a picture of a pizza and what's a picture of a hot dog and what's a picture of a spaghetti and that sort of uh, thing. The famous hot dog detector. We did it before <laughs> Silicon Valley. Um, yeah, so, uh, well, I could probably do a whole show on how convolutional ne- neural networks work, but uh, suffice it to say, that's a really good algorithm that's been developed over many decades for trying to determine, uh, trying to label um, and classify images. Um, images are very hard to classify. It's not like you know trying to predict. It's not like trying to predict some numbers for another by adding up the numbers. You know, an image for to a computer is just a matrix of numbers, and it's like, okay, w- what math equation can I use with that matrix of numbers to tell me is this like a cat? It's it seems almost impossible, you know. And so, <laughs> uh, convolutional neural nets are a way to sort of get those higher order patterns um, that are actually available in the data. And so you have this discriminator model, and at the same time you build this generator model that looks at these re- that looks at these uh, real faces and builds these fake faces. You could kind of think of it as a convolutional neural net in reverse. And so what you need for these learners is feedback. You know, is it getting it right or is it getting it wrong? And so the generator kind of learns the different knobs it's allowed to turn and what it's not allowed to turn. So for example, it might have one knob that makes the person, it might learn one knob that makes the person older and younger. It might make have another knob that makes their face, I don't know, rounder and then like less round, but then if they turn the knob too much, it's just not a face anymore. Um, but those those higher order features also have to be learned in sort of a convolutional neural network style. Um, okay, so there's some kind of randomness that the generator has to determine that it's always building different faces. Otherwise, if it's trying to maximize uh, the discriminator, like maximize faceness, then it will reach a local maximum. And we don't want to reach a local maximum here on the show. So I always have to add that in. So, okay, so you need training data for each one. Every time you build a model. Wait, so if we're trying to yeah. maximize faceness, does that yeah. mean we could arrive at the ideal face? Um, no, well, it would be the face that is most, most likely to be viewed as a face. Most likely to be viewed as a face. And so what I suspect is, is that that really doesn't exist. You might get two faces that look very different, but they both look equally real. And so instead of having a, um, well, think about it. Remember in in, uh, uh, episode four, I believe, back when we did the decryption of, uh, so at some point you're decrypting a string that's so small that you could make multiple real words with it. And when that happens, it really can't tell the difference between uh, you know, is it b- between, you know, is this the real decrypted or is, is it this one? They're, they're both pretty likely or often what would happen was is that the real one would actually be less likely than the one that it, it found. And so I think you get a bunch of different local maximums and all of them corresponds to real faces. Some of them will probably be given higher numbers than others just by chance, but, um, the highest numbered one probably wouldn't be anything special. It would probably just be another face. Um, so yeah, does that make sense? <laughs> I, no I think idea. so, yeah. I, okay. it's, it's, it's tempting to think of, oh, the, we, we've, we've maximized for the perfect face in terms, and, and to think in terms of, of a measure of beauty, but no, we're just um, thinking in terms of, it, yeah, it's a face. <laughs> right, right. And so, and not just a, so I've seen this where it's like, you know, detecting like facial recognition. And it literally just comes up with like uh, two eyes, a nose and a mouth, and that's it. Like, it's like, that's all it's looking for when it's just trying to recognize face. Here, what it's doing a little bit differently is like, so that, that's the version I kind of saw in grad school where it was just very lightly defined black and white face that it was looking for. Um, but this is a little different. Right. Well, and, actually- and that's useful for if you're looking uh, you know, in, in a photograph which may or may not have a face, can you identify, is there a face? And and if so, you know, how many, where are they? Yeah, not, yeah, yeah. It's not going to tell you, you know, is, well, I, yeah, I, I don't know what I was going to compare it to, but but that, that's what it's right. geared to. And you, you don't need the, the level of, of believability tied here to identify eyes, nose, mouth, 
it must be a face. Right. And so, okay. So the point I want to bring, bring, uh, drive home here is that every machine learning model needs feedback. It needs to say, hey, you did the right thing. Great. The direction that I'm moving my weights in was a good direction. I'll keep moving them in that direction. Or no, you actually did the wrong thing. Okay. I need to stop. I, I need to train in the opposite direction. And so here, well, you can have a generator start with you could kind of seed it a little bit, right? You could seed the generator with examples of faces and say, hey, build another image that looks like these images. Um, so you can have the generator go first. And then the discriminator is judged by how well it could figure out what's real and what's coming from the generator. So at first, it's really easy because the generator kind of sucks, right? The generator is trying to come up with faces and they don't look very good. and the discriminator is having an easy time saying, yep, that's a face. Nope, that's not a face. But then what happens is the discriminator or, or the generator then gets judged on those answers. And so it learns more of like the, the boundary case, like, um, you know, it, it hones in on where the boundary between faceness and non-faceness is, or at least like real photograph, in this case, real photograph faceness, and then a face that's still a representation of a face, but but can be, can be, pointed out that's not a real person. And so the discriminator makes the generator better. And then as the generator gets better, the discriminator's job gets harder. So the discriminator then has to get better. And so they kind of feed off each other. And there's kind of this, um, there's kind of this feedback where they're both trying to get better at each other. And again, like I said, it could be, uh, it can be seeded with uh, human labels. Um, but that I think is the general idea of how it works. Now, here's one thing that's interesting about this is that you might think, oh no, this generator is gonna be very good and it's gonna be coming up with faces that we can't tell the difference. But at the same time, at the same time, the discriminator is also getting really good. It's an arms race there too. So as you're generating better and better, uh, let's, say, let's say someone's trying to generate like a, a fake video to try to fool the world, if they're using a, a GAN to do it, then the technology for figuring out whether that's fake is also getting better at the same rate. So we don't know where it's going. Is it going to a case where it can match it perfectly? Or does the GAN architecture ultimately mean that, um, that there'll be a discriminator that's really good? Um, I think it might get to a place where it actually can find a way to make these images uh, and then like the uh, the generator beats the discriminator, but because it has this architecture, I think the discriminator is gonna be gonna keep up for like a pretty long period of time, longer than like there there could be a period where humans can't tell the difference at all. In, it seems like we can in this case, but um, but these uh, these discriminators absolutely can. Yeah, I, I think. It, it turns into a resource battle at that point. So even assuming that that uh, the the technology and the algorithms are are equally available to both both sides of the equation here. Well, they have to be. Um, you have to improve one side to improve the other side. Right, right. But if if uh, you know my research group comes up with an improvement, that doesn't mean that Google, who is trying to combat my my uh, weaponized deep fakes, is also going to have access to that same methodology. True, true. But uh, but, but, but Google, even if we assume for Google a moment that have they do, the highest, uh, yeah. It, it becomes a question of who's willing to throw more more resources at what, um, right? Because yeah, it I I may be able to rent you know rent server time and 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 generate something amazingly convincing you know with a few few days or a few weeks worth of of computing power, uh, and and then and a an adversary who's trying to defend against that who not only has to spend that same amount of time running my product through their their reverse process but also has to be running that same process on an order of magnitude more information coming in because it's not it it's never can you identify whether this is a needle it's can you identify the needle in the haystack yeah yeah i see so, what you're saying so so, so it like becomes a much a much harder thing to defend against even if if we're assuming a technologically level playing field. Well, I mean, a lot of these things are, you know, you can train them. It's it's very hard to train them, but once you've trained your discriminator, like um, it, running all of your data through it is not as big of a deal. Ah, so, okay. Yeah. That makes sense. So, um, and, so, and there are some problems yeah. that throwing more computing power at them doesn't make them, I mean, it, yeah. It, if, if, I'm, if, if I'm trying to generate these fake faces, uh, it, it's going to take what it takes, 
putting more CPU cycles into it isn't necessarily going to make it a better fake face. Right, right. So yeah, I just wanted to give people kind of an overview of how this works. And this is, I mean, you know, people are going crazy over this. People are scared. You know, <laughs> what <laughs> all these fake videos, what is that going to mean? But I think understanding how it works maybe can give people a little comfort or maybe maybe more discomfort. I don't know. <laughs> what, what, what I haven't heard yet, and I, I really yeah. want to hear something about, is, is everybody's worried about... Um, is it Google or or IBM that was doing or not IBM uh, Microsoft that was that was they they got a lot of bad publicity because they were talking about helping uh, the military or some government do facial recognition algorithms to to better identify and track people. Um, how can we use this technology to combat that? Uh, is there a way that we can you know fl flood the system with with not real people or uh, a way to to trick closed circuit television cameras into thinking that I look like a different person than I do without, you know, putting on a mask and makeup. And I, and I, I don't know how that's going to work, but, but that, that's the first problem I saw this is, oh, maybe there's some way this can combat that. That, that in a world where we're constantly surveilled and, and they can use facial recognition software, can we throw out so many non-existent garbage faces out there that, that we can at least, uh, hide through obscurity if nothing else there because we're, we're just going to be noise in the yeah. noise in the signal well it's interesting that uh, that you asked that because i think the next discussion that i want to have with you maybe it could be the uh, the episode in a couple of weeks is how the how the internet and latest developments are affecting um authoritarian regimes around the world there have been a lot of articles coming out um, very interesting about the internet in Cuba, about Bitcoin in Venezuela. I have a feeling, um, well, there are probably some things about North Korea as well. Um, and I definitely want to cover that um, and draw some parallels to how, how, how all of these technologies are affecting you know, the political systems in, in first world countries. So that should be an interesting topic. Uh, I want, if anyone wants to weigh in before we have that discussion, localmaxradio at gmail.com. Uh, I'm looking forward to discussing that with you, Aaron. Yeah, and it's it's something we've touched on before, um, in in the context of of kind of the the green revolutions uh, in in uh, in Asia uh, and and Twitter and and Facebook and and their involvement there. Uh, but that's that's almost a decade ago now that that well maybe not that long ago, but it's it's years ago that that happened, and and we're seeing another round of of kind of uh, shifts in authoritarian regimes potentially happening. And it'll be very interesting to see what ro what role technology takes in that. Yeah, okay. In a couple of weeks in the local maximum, we'll get to that. All right, <laughs> I think good. we're, yeah, I think, um, I, I think that covers it for today. Uh, thanks for uh, fa another fascinating discussion. Yeah, it's it's always a pleasure, and uh, we'll we'll see how this live streaming thing works out. If that's yeah, well, next time we'll get some more people. We'll try. Yeah. All right. Have a great week, everyone. Okay. Now I can take Audacity off. Okay. Or, and should or... I stop the live broadcast as well? Hang on a sec. I'm gonna save the Audacity stream. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop the broadcast.